what's up? Welcome to Plaid Chat. It's episode 116. We, yes, we are still pumping them out. Yes, we missed one last week. I don't know when the last time we missed an episode was, but it feels like eons. It feels like actual years. So we took we took one week off in the middle of the offseason, but we're back with a special guest, in fact. We've got a, a guest that knows much more than us about the challenges and trials and tribulations of building a roster when you don't know what game you're going to be playing coming up next. Uh, it's it's Albert Yeo, yeah, um, who has been creating rosters and stuff. I, I mean, I assume you've been in the weeds, in the mud, doing all of these moves, making big mogul money moves for the past few months. What what, have, what has life been like trying to prep for Overwatch 2 and Overwatch League in 2022? Yeah, it's been it's been pretty wild. Uh, I think the pacing at which teams kind of assemble or the league assembled or all the orgs just decided, hey, let's build a ro- let's build our rosters in like two months. Um, kind of crazy. Also, I guess the league. Since they have a mandate, you needed five um, by January third, so that kind of pushed the timeline mm. up uh, because basically you had to sign five before you even touched the Overwatch two build. Um, so <laughs> once that once that kind of happened, then we were just like, okay, well, every team just started signing players. It's like, well, either you hop on that train or you just get whatever scraps are left if you want to wait around. How different is it compared to previous off seasons? Because always in the off season, there's going to be moves happening. But to me, from the outside, it feels like things happened way quicker this year. And I'm sure there was some craziness in terms of decision making because of what you've mentioned. The fact that you have to get five together before you've even had a chance to play the, the new game that's coming up. So how, what are some of the biggest differences for this season compared to the previous off seasons from a GM's point of view? Yeah, so I'd say let's start with like, what if... If we were just an Overwatch one, like hypothetically. So, like, what would a normal, more normal off season look like? I think this off season would have just been: <laughs> Do we get two flex supports? Right? Like, is that a trend? Is that is that some is that something every team can replicate? Is that superior to just the flex support and main support? Um, I think that would have just been the only adjustment. Is pretty much teams trying to figure out what's best for them, um, what they think. But then now you add on top of that. Okay, it looks like. We've slowly been, or some of the higher end teams have been shifting towards like a double flex support look, and then on top of that, it's Overwatch two, and then it's you know that's like one tank. What does that one tank look like? How does that affect? How does only having one tank affect the rest of the lineup and how they have to play? And does that change what you're looking for in all the other positions? Um, so I think instead of just going in like theory crafting based on what happened this past season, it's just a like everything like everything's on the table um, but do you at least feel confident like w- with the roster you've signed do you, talking to other coaches other yeah. teams like do you get a sense that like teams are confident in their lineups or, or do you feel like it's more chaotic like we're just signing dudes and like hoping that like we're, we're coming out on top with like the right kind of mix of players or like having done tryouts you know getting some players in and out do you, do you feel like florida mayhem is in a good place as it stands so our, I can't speak for other teams, but for us, it wasn't. Some some teams can just, you know, we have this huge war chest. We're just going to sign whoever the best talent is right now, or like, you know, known stars, known quantities, and just be like, that, you know, nobody can fault us for signing like the best players we can for, you know, however money, how more, however much money we're willing to spend, right? And then for us, it was a little different. Every single person that we signed went through a trialing process this year, as opposed to, you know, in in some past years. Um, we've just been okay. Like for example, Yaki Ganjin, Like we didn't need to trial them when we signed them. We just we knew they were good. Right? Yeah. Like, there were no quantities. Like I don't need to see. I don't need to trial Yaki to figure out if he's good or not, or if he's gonna be able to make the jump. Um, so this year is much different. Let's trial everyone. Um, let's. Then there was also the question. I it, it was a lot better because once I got my coaching staff in place, that I could have other people to talk to. Otherwise, it would have been very lonely just trying to figure that out by myself. Um, yeah, yeah. So much, much better having people to bounce ideas off of to discuss. Like, also, it also helps that Gumba kind of took a break, came back. Um, hold on, what happened to my camera? <laughs> it happens <laughs> every is, episode. Last this... week it was uh, not last week, but like two weeks okay. ago it was me. Uh, I I just turned digital. Yeah, it was crazy. This time it's you. It's uh, okay. it, 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 it's fine. It just makes for great thumbnails. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> so no, don't worry about it. Yeah. So where was I fixed it? But anyway, so. After yeah, Gumba took a took a break, came back, and I think mm. he had like a fresh outlook, which I think is also necessary 
it kind of helped that you know nobody knows what's going to go happen in a rush too also he comes from like a 5v5 it's like there's different um so we, we kind of talk through i think every coaching staff every like management um or gm has like different ideas on what the game will look like of course uh, and i think it's really just only time will tell who was right who was wrong um did we make the right decisions um but i feel very strongly on the decisions we made um given the information the information that we we had uh so we did we did kind of hybrid trials so initially we were like okay let's let's do 6v6 to get as many people in as we can look at as many tanks because with if you're doing 5v5 trials you don't really you can't look at as many tanks you can't it's more efficient um to have six players in the lobby as opposed to five right when you're when you're going through trials uh, so we did that initially and then when we narrowed it down to like hey this is our core roster we need another main we need a main support or we need a second support um then we kind of switched to the 5v5 and gumba put together like a whole workshop co kind of compiled like Paris had a workshop. I think he used right, that right. as like a base. I think there was like a Korean version or a Chinese. I'm not sure. He he basically took like every single Overwatch 2 workshop out there, like looked at the code and then like kind of compiled it and made like like a Frankenstein um, workshop mode that we then scrimmed versus so, like Al teams and APAC teams. I just like you to expand on that uh, for a minute. The entire approach, because I mean the listeners uh, and the people who follow the Overwatch League, they don't really have any insight on like how tryouts work and like how gathering all these players, you know, we heard about Boston Uprising before where they, they try to like find the best diamonds in the rough, you know, yeah. contenders in open division and they host these huge tryouts. So I want to get to you because uh, you mentioned this uh, before we started the episode that you utilized, you know, that workshop to uh, actually hold tryouts in five versus five, et cetera. But, but just from the start, like just to give the, the viewers, uh, listeners an idea, like, wh where did you start? Did you have, like, one tryout for, like, NA, one for Korea? Because you got a great mix of players here. I mean, uh, you, you got Koreans, you got Australians, you know, everyone. There's so many different regions in this team. Can you just, like, holistically, like, where do you start when it comes to tryouts? Do you, like, hold trial for separate regions? Then you combine that into a single Discord, and then you went into five versus five? Like, what does it look like, the entire process? So, yeah, as you said, we we're kind of had a global scouting outlook this year. We weren't limited to, like, hey, we you know we want a full Korean team or we want a full Western team. It was everything's on the table, right? Like every region. So Koreans, Chinese players, European players, like Middle Eastern players, like anyone, um, American players. So the way we did this was okay, now it's now it's your turn to <laughs> <laughs> to turn to a blob. Don't worry about blob. it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Don't worry about it. Um, so we had like kind of a eu type or eu slash east um server or discord server where we would try out because it's hard to trial eu players and korean players at the same time um unless you're majed i guess he's but he's middle eastern so actually he pings better too <laughs> he doesn't mind playing on, on on korea or on west servers um but for the most part it's pretty hard to trial also there are different time zones like when when it's time for eu players to try out the time zone doesn't line up with Korean players. Did you just, did you just like wake up 3 a.m. to just like do Europe trials? Oh, we were up for, God, I was up till like 7 a.m. <laughs> oh, like for like two horrendous. weeks, for like two weeks straight. Like just, <laughs> um, yeah, our schedule was brutal. It was like, okay, let's do one block for you and then like let's take a two hour break and then like I, I think two to four, we would, we would. Do like Korean scrims um, or Korean trials, and then it was just it was just a mess. Um, Holy shit, that's a huge undertaking. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it does it sound was... horrendous. It sounds like a horrendous <laughs> job because at the end of the day, as well, you're also trialing on a workshop mode. You're not sure is even similar to the game that yeah. you're going to be playing too. If it sounds, if you were coming from a different game and and you had a you know. Any other esport, and you learn how Overwatch League is doing things this year, it would sound yeah. ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you get the confidence that your process has been good when the information is so sparse on what? you're going to be selecting them for like the, in previous years you kind of have an idea of oh i know what qualities i'm looking for in this player for example with tanks when you don't really know what t the tank role is going to look like again are you trying to look for people who are um literally just impacting the success of their team winning that trial block 
or is it are, are there certain qualities you personally think are going to be useful I, I, I what what what's the selection process look like i i think for us it's not about whether you win the block like that's not important it's, you watch on their pov you figure out mechanically like are they gifted enough on enough heroes um and then True. like how are they calling from their perspective like understand like what what the calls they're making are do those calls make sense could they do anything better um what type of play style do they have uh and kind of go from there so i think for a tank specifically we're looking for someone that had as much flexibility as possible because there's only one tank next year right yeah. um so you're looking for main tank you're looking for off tank um and then the question becomes do you get an off tank that has okay to decent main tank or do you get a primary main tank that has decent off tank heroes True. right like yeah those are the two big questions or do you just say fuck it let's just have a main tank and an off tank and just you know just delineate like okay well maybe if, if it's just a hard off tank meta he just plays off tank if we're you know in a hard main tank meta and you kind of bet on those two being you know play around their strengths instead of having someone that can kind of blend um move between the two roles as we know it now uh so yeah that's kind of how we approach the tank position um and then for someone like when we picked him up we were looking at he's very flexible like i think he hit four point i mean not that he plays dps for us but i think he's our 4.5 tracer right now on the ladder so like he's he's super mechanically strong and that's what we really like filtered out for like who's mechanically strong on multiple heroes and we you know i think that's the best i guess i, I don't want to say indicator because i don't know what the end result is but we we think that's like one of the better indicators on yeah it's just like a, make the transition overwatch too a global heuristic that you could use yeah. you know you're probably going to be a good player if you're able to do all of that in overwatch one like if you can play all roles to 4.4 or whatever in overwatch one yeah you'll probably be able to handle whatever overwatch 2 throws at you that's the major thought process yeah exactly um and just looking at how they under because Playing off tank is vastly different from playing main tank and vice versa, and just seeing how they can kind of switch, uh, switch styles or switch um, switch modes, is or switch gears is important. And I think someone had like all those qualities, and then when we're looking at, we're like, okay, let's sign a main tank, let's sign an off tank. Um, hopefully, one of our tanks can you know end up doing both. But like worst case scenario, like we need, we decided we also wanted you know that off tank specialization just in case there's like a hard off tank meta for example sure. so we're not just completely screwed sure. um were there any players that you that you thought ah they're all right when you tried them in the 6v6 mode but when you tried them in the 5v5 workshop they surprised you or impressed you or were more adaptable and so there were other qualities where we might not think of them as a great overwatch one player but they actually did show some qualities that lead you to believe, oh, this guy actually might be really good when it comes to Overwatch 2 or the adaptation of the game or 5v5 or some element like that. Um, I think I, I did learn... Uh, we did learn a lot playing 5v5 about some of our players that we signed. Um, but I wouldn't say there was anyone that was like, oh, wow, like... He wasn't built for Overwatch 1, right? Like, he's an Overwatch 2 player. Like, sure, that never sure. <laughs> That never really occurred to me. I think for us, it was mostly like... so um kind of call out majed but like majed he's from the eu region right they don't really play anna or like dive and i think for us like we were playing kr like okay let's like let's run anna dive and he had never played anna on kr like in his life you know like that's <laughs> not a thing in the eu like you, right. you don't you don't you don't play anna on king's row like that's very much like a you know koreans like playing dive on sure, on kr sure. right like that's just a foreign concept right and just seeing how fast he like improved on anna um over the course of like the weeks that we're playing 5v5 it's also like a different at least the current iteration we have it's it's a much fa like spawns are faster right it's like the game is just faster mm. like kills that you can't actually take it slow anymore where it's like okay you get one you get one kill like maybe you 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 know you get your foot off the gas pedal wait for you, know, you get get a full tick or get three ticks on kr or something like that right that doesn't happen because the spawns are faster so you can contest faster so if you don't finish off all the kills they get a contest whereas in overwatch one like sometimes you you know one kill and then like they back off or you get half yeah yeah like a ha half team wipe is you know you, you're you're fine like that secures the point so so you did notice that difference in gameplay between like the, the workshop mode and overwatch one ranked whatever did, did that get you pumped or is there like what was there i know it's just a workshop mode but like watching the best of the best go like head to head in uh 
in, in, in tryouts like that on five versus five and you say that the dynamic is a bit different it's faster gameplay like did that get you psyched for overwatch 2 uh did do you feel like it's going to be vastly different from like overwatch league in 2021 where it's six versus six you know atlanta rain they play like shield comps and uh you know playing with big ultimate abilities like what 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 are your thoughts going into five versus five having seen those workshop modes so i think flex support might be the hardest role now okay because because you just get do it's like a it's actually like just a horror it's like a horror game watching my sometimes <laughs> play zen and it's because it's like there's no there's no deep i mean if you have a diva that's your only tank right there's no second tank yeah. to peel so and you generally at least the way we've been scrimming teams don't yeah you know if you have one tank you, that tank's usually taking space right you're not playing like a five man where you're just babysitting your back line because then you know you, you just get surrounded and you just get killed right so there's really no tank to peel so it's just it's just a different way to play and it seems like zen anna like no matter what you're playing on flex support you're the you're generally like the dive target no matter what you know if they're running any sort of dive like it's oh there's the anna there's a zen like let's just go in also with there's a lot of sombra being run because sombra got buffed right <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. a lot <laughs> like you, so. you you yeah if you get hacked you get i think it's like 40 percent extra damage like it's absurd so yeah. you're you're playing zen you're playing anna against somber dive comps and you, and the hacks like instant and also majed's on high ping so it's like I, I don't know it just looked like i was like i don't understand how he's playing the game um and you know i i i don't know how i would play the game if if i was a flex support so i think flex support under a lot of pressure for overwatch 2 it seems um I, I assume that um, I assume you've scrimmed against other teams that are kind of building their rosters up as well. Yeah. And um, what do you know? What the player kind of um, thought process is about these kind of uh, cu custom game modes that are attempting to replicate Overwatch Two? Is that do do you feel like the general vibe is that people enjoy the higher pace of the game? Are they not even talking about that particularly? Are they just focused on improving? What, what what's your thought process when it comes to what the players have been like the receptiveness of the change um i don't i think it's hard to gauge i feel like when you just load in and you start playing the game like all the players kind of enter into you know that like flow state or that like mm -hmm. kind of that when you're scrimming you just kind of enter that zone right you're like okay we're scrimming and then i don't really think they have time to really process like how they're feeling about mm -hmm. it it's just kind of like okay let's figure out how we can win i think the most important thing about the initial scrims is like developing chemistry as a team um, like so, like what plays are good now? Like what ults do you use? Like what, who who are the dive like partners? Um, what are the timings? The timings are all different, and it's like positioning's different now. Um, like how you position on support's different. You have to like I, I think it's just they don't have time to think about like how because it doesn't really matter what their opinions on Overwatch two, right? Like it's going to be on Overwatch two. Like your opinion of it doesn't really matter. Um, you're going to be playing Overwatch two next year, so you need you, you need to learn to deal with it. Um, and you need to problem solve and figure out a way to uh to kind of transition into rush too mm -hmm. yeah i you, you gotta think as well that you know we we know that sombra was incredibly overpowered um of course losing an off tank is like you say like not having a diva to peel for you with defense matrix that's a huge like has enormous impact on the game and how it plays um at the same time you gotta imagine that that's also just like the meta right now um, and eventually the balance team is probably going to step in with Overwatch 2 and just be like, well, how do we prevent all these teams from literally just diving headfirst in with Winston and Tracer every single game? Yeah. Like, do we have to buff Brig so that she just becomes like the most amazing peeler and like provide armor to everyone? Or like, there's go they're going to find different ways to have different metas in the game. So, I, you know, it, right now there's a lot of Sombra. You, you can feel... I mean, we also don't know that that's life. even the up-to-date balance patch. We don't. Yeah, like, sure, that, sure. That's, no, it might uh, have already uh, changed, and people uh, are just playing uh, a completely know, different yeah. game. It's just, maybe it's just cop copium, Josh. I'm just yeah. trying to be like, hey, I know this is what everyone's saying right now, but maybe it'll be different in the future yeah. as well. So, of I'm course, sure the gameplay's different. You know, we're all eager to see it, but uh, eventually, balance designers are going to step in and change the way the game is played, uh, I, even if it's five versus five too, right? So, I mean, that's before we even throw in new heroes. I mean, if there are new heroes for right. the rush to build, like I don't, I don't actually have any additional information. I mean, I don't know. Maybe no. Sojourn's out. Then is it just Sojourn? Is it a bunch of other heroes that they haven't told us about? I have no idea. Um, yeah.
What's um, um, the, I I had one final question though before we move on to talking about the actual Florida Mayhem roster that you've got together related yep. to the tryouts. What the hell do you do with the heroes in the game that they didn't talk about? Like they there were some heroes in the game they didn't even say how they changed. They just had yep. them kind of locked off, unavailable to play. From the top of my head, I think it was like Arissa, Doom, yeah. uh, Cassidy. Um, yeah. I can't exactly remember all of them, but there was some section of heroes like that. So for Cassidy, I believe their change was it doesn't stun you anymore. It's a root, correct? I don't know. Did I? I don't know. I might have. Made I can't that. remember. They're trying to get rid of the CC stuff. They're trying to get rid of the stun. Right. And, yeah, so I think CC I think stuff, Cassidy so. just has a root now instead of a stun. Um, like Flash just roots you. Um, so I I think, but for what Gumba did in the workshop, I, I think the Paris version had a bunch of just speculative changes like i think the, the mercy one that was just a rumor like i don't even know where they got the that mercy like rumor from it wasn't in any like the dev notes yeah. or, or or like it wasn't in any of the play tests um but basically we just took whatever we could from the play test and incorporated it um, right, right. into so like if arissa wasn't touched so arissa is the same um oh right so you didn't have the paris charging arissa Right, um, yeah, or like do, we didn't have the doomfist becomes a tank modification we don't actually yes, know yeah, yeah. um but we did have like a no longer freezes um and mm -hmm. i think that was an interesting change as people i think we try to play rush and like checkmates out here like trying to freeze and like trying to like why doesn't he freeze he's like well he doesn't freeze anymore so <laughs> so not a, and that not was the a, last time checkmate played me <laughs> yeah not a, not it turns out not so great when you can't freeze anyone um <laughs> and then god what else do we have yeah but just watching them all try to figure out like the new heroes and and the interactions there um yeah. Mm. Yeah. So okay. a bit of a transitional question to talking about uh, the roster then, because I'm very curious about this, uh, considering how you uh, held the tryouts this year. You have, uh, like I mentioned it earlier, a lot of different uh, nationalities and regions on this team. So Checkmate, Animo, someone, they're Korean, Adam's from Australia, of course, uh, Summer Jet, he's, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and then you have Hydron, who's from America as well. How do you try out when it comes to like the team chemistry? Uh, or like how good of a teammate someone is. Because when you hold tryouts, it's very easy to, you know, like you said, spectate someone's POV. They got great mechanics, great shot calling. But can you really predict like how they interact as a teammate? Do you have to go check with other coaches or former teammates, etc.? How how when you look at this roster right here on Liquipedia, like how do you come to terms with knowing that this is a great team with players who are going to help each other out and you know be good to each other rather than just you know, throw them into a mix and see how it goes. Yeah, so I think it's hard. I think the answer to that is really you don't. It's kind of on the coaching staff to foster that sort of environment to get the most out of players and get them on the same page. Um, but at the same time, there's ways you can kind of preempt that in a way. So like, for example, Mir, I think he's been on a bunch of mixed rosters and he's kind of, it seems like he's always served as kind of the bridge between Western players and Korean players. Like I think all the, you know, he knows all the Korean players, like he, he interacts with them a lot, like especially on Glads. It seemed like he, you know, he was really close to Burn Ring, and so I think for us, it was like, okay, we have kind of a Korean section or cohort as well, um, and he could definitely help bridge the gap between you know, the that Korean, the the group of Koreans that we have, and then the, the Western players. Um, I think for Checkmate and someone like they actually know each other, um, so they're they're friends, and that's something we kind of like figured out as we were doing trials like oh like checkmate actually knows someone and then that's you know that's like already chemistry or pre-existing relationship there adam he cues on care ranked all the time um because he's australian and that's you know that's the best practice australians can get generally yeah. speaking is queuing on high ping korea um so he's you know he's familiar with playing he's not foreign to playing with koreans i think the person with the least or i guess there's two with like kind of the least experience is Hy hydron and majed majed probably has the least experience because Koreans don't really queue EU, whereas Hydron definitely has experience queuing with, you know, interact with Koreans on, on ranked and NA when they're here for Owl. Um, but I think there are like, there's like a baseline here where it's like there are some pre existing friendships um, and there's some pre existing like friend groups and like Mirror being there as kind of a bridge. Um, and then after that, it's kind of, you know, how can our coaching staff like Gumba, Gravy, Day One, and myself, like how can we foster a Korean environment where everyone kind of feels comfortable and everyone's on the same page um and you know we we get work together as a team in and out of the game what are you excited about about this roster what what when you look at this roster on paper what gets you going about the florida mayhem for 2022 
Um, well, I looked at it. I was like, this is a very gumbo roster. Um, and... <laughs> it definitely is. It gives me yeah. serious LA Valiant from what what year was that? 2019? 2020? I got 2020, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, very underdog, like a lot of underdog energy here. Um, very what young you say players. That misfits. <laughs> not not quite not quite because we do have some we do have some i mean they all fit i i don't know they <laughs> i feel it's like the only pun i'm sorry yeah, i'm no, sorry no, i should have said that it's, it's... <laughs> sorry there was an attempt uh but you know they're we're, they're young uh they're hungry i think the average age of our roster right now is 19 because anima kind of fucked it i think it was 18 anima's you know kind of old so he raised <laughs> he it went from it jumped from 18 to 19 because he's 24 right, um, right. but we have a very young we have a very young group, um, and you know I think they're all hungry. I think there's a lot to prove here. Um, Automo, you know he he's our like I don't want to say he's the lone vet because actually Mirror's been in the league for a bit now, um, but Automo's the only one on this roster from season one. Mm. The, that that was actually the the one thing that stood out to me when I actually like you know did my research on some of these players too. Like a lot of these players have something to prove. Uh, I mean, you can go down the list. So, like, Checkmate, obviously not optimal last season. Had to come in to play some tank for the team. Got a couple of showings playing DPS. Mirror was always kind of... Not always, but it was a little bit on the back burner for the Gladiators. Obviously, they had a great DPS duo with Kevster and Birdring, and then Mirror could fill in once in a while, play some heroes. Adam dropped by the Valiant, you know, yeah. after he got picked up initially. Animo didn't have the greatest season for Soul, and I, I, I think he wants a bit of redemption from that as well, because a lot of people... Have a, have a pretty um they, they don't rate him as high anymore uh Majed is from saudi arabia it's like who who, who plays overwatch from the saudi arabia you know yeah. uh so there's a lot of a lot of players here who uh could come together and really want to prove something this year combine that you know with gunba as a coach for this team like i agree with you when you mentioned that i i think this is a roster that could really just click really fast and just have been, be really motivated to beat some of these teams in the Overwatch League. I, I think my biggest thing is like everything fits. Like everything makes sense on our roster. Um, like we have three DPS players. Mirror has tank flexibility. I guess you could argue Checkmate has tank flexibility as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, t I, I guess we have four tanks on this roster. Um, like someone, I think he is. I, I don't know. I think I'm super happy we got someone. I think he's su like. I don't think many people understand like how good he is because I, I just think he hasn't, you know, he's, he's very underrated as a player. Yeah. There's some um, research. He's super hyped. He's like one of the best tanks coming out of contenders this year. <laughs> yeah. I think it was very under the radar. I don't know. For some reason, uh, also like just, I think our approach to roster building this year was like, I, I think a lot of teams kind of fall into a trap of like, let's wait for a number one option. Whereas like, Sometimes, like, your, the difference between your number one and number two option is really not that much. Or it's like a coin toss. Like, you know, could, your second option could actually be better than your first option, depending on, you know, how the season turns out. And so I yeah, think for yeah. us, it was, like, being very focused and being very disciplined on when we sign players. Like, hey, these are, these are, this is where we rank all these players. Are we fine going with our second option? Like, who is the sure fight? Can we, if we can secure our second option, do we want to risk, like, losing that and trying to, you know, hit a home run right on, on first? Um, and I think as we kind of went through our roster building process, we're like, okay, we're fine with, you know, we just made very good decisions and like had very narrow timing windows that we hit on all these players. Cause some of these players, I think there's only, I think all of them had, we had competition for, um, had other offers. Mm. Uh, so it was like a very, this wasn't like the scraps by any means. Like th these were some of these players were, you know, multiple teams were looking at them. Yeah. Um, and so. Just very happy with how our roster build came out. Very happy with how all the pieces fit. Um, I think we have everything covered. At least, you know, I say that now. I have no idea. Well, in, exactly, exactly. In, in like two months, we could have nothing covered, right? But <laughs> from where I'm standing now, like the current, as we currently understand Overwatch and like how it looks like it's going to be in Overwatch Two, I think we have every hero covered, and we have, you know, we'll we'll, we'll be very competitive. The only thing that I look at this roster and I feel like, because I agree with you, the DPS, the tank, that all looks really good. The only thing that looks to me like there could be a hole is the conversation that you were having earlier. You brought up, actually, the idea of double flex support potentially being a thing. And a lot of other yeah. teams in the league going towards that and thinking, oh, well, potentially this might be where the meta is headed or this might be just where the game is headed in general with 
reports from the players playing uh, Hawaii saying that L Lucio and Mercy were uh, not particularly yeah. great at the time as well. I wonder uh, why... Or, or can you walk me through the, the thought process in terms of your very um, classic decision to get a flex support player and a main support player compared to the alternative, which is to either get three or get a double flex support and just kind of train one of them to play the main support roles? Right. Yeah. So when we were looking at the last support, I think everything was on the table. It's like we looked at flex supports. We looked at main supports. Um and then after we were like, hey, here's all the flex sports, here's all the main sports that are available. Let's look at their hero pools, right? Like, let's break down who's most, who covers most of the hero or more the most heroes, um, and kind of start prioritizing there. Who's the most flexible, and then work our way down, um, and then start trialing them, see how they fit in the team, see if they can adapt to the kind of the pacing of Overwatch two, um, see if they're too stuck in their ways. Because I think when we were trialing some Overwatch players, it became clear that some of them. It, like when you're scrimming a rush to 5v5 for the first time you have to really like use your brain you have to like really think about like how does how has the game changed right like this is a different game like do they do they adapt their game or do they try to just do overwatch one stuff in overwatch two right. um, and i think that was like the biggest thing and as we kind of kept on trialing and we kind of reached a point where we're like okay it looks like they support it's probably not as dead as some of these other teams think it is. Okay. Um, and so we were like, I think we do need a Lucio player, right? We do need a, a Brig player. We do need, you know, maybe a Mercy player. Um, and I think for us, it was like, okay, it looks like we were, we started leaning towards, we want a main support that has some flex capabilities rather than a flex that has like, okay ish, or like that could play main support in a pinch. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of how, kind of how our process kind of narrowed down to to Animo. Yeah, um, I'd where... like to talk about Animo, but just before that, I want to. You brought up the idea of players doing Overwatch one stuff in Overwatch two. Could you give me some example, some more specific kind of uh, example of that? Are you talking about positioning or how they're using their abilities, or what, what do you mean when you say people doing Overwatch one stuff in Overwatch two? Yeah, so I think. So everything's changed, right? So tanks get tank more damage. I think initially for Overwatch 1, it's like you just poke at the tank forever, build nano, and then go, right? Whereas for Overwatch 2, at least the way we we were scrimming it, it didn't. there was nothing that stopped you. Like, you didn't have to play the waiting game because there's no peel. If you see their flex support, you can dive them. If you can right. see their flex support and you dive them, they're usually dead. So then it's like, are you, are you proactive? You have to be way more proactive, and yet you can be way more aggressive with how you approach fights in Overwatch 2. And so it was like, are they setting up fights? Are they seeing those opportunities? And are they diving? Are they calling? And are they are they being proactive with setting up plans and dives? Um, so I, th I think there's a lot more mini games that can happen, whereas Overwatch 1 was more like, OK, we're sitting at a choke. Our wince is taking a billion poke, like waiting for Nano. And then after Nano, we go, right? Like, I think that was yeah. like, just you look at last season, like that happened so much. Where There's a lot of waiting around, building support alts, then go. But now it's like, you don't have to wait. You can just go. Um, right, because right. you know there's only one tank, so there's not as much peel. You can just go in, um, go in with your tank, and then try to make something happen. Try to trade, um, or or try to you know get the early picks. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, you have titled the next topic, so I'm going to let you lead it because you've got a you've got a spicy title for this oh, one. Oh, wasn't that bad? I mean, no, okay. it's not that bad, right. but it's right. it's certainly it begins with the presupposition that people believe Animo is washed up. So the, the <laughs> it's Animo not washed after all. He's a he's a dirty boy. <laughs> he's oh, not... uh, I I mean, come on! Why well, you gotta why well, you gotta sing me out like this? Okay, we're trying to we're trying to create entertainment in the middle <laughs> of the I'm saying. I'm saying, season, you know, you go out there and, and explain explain to the people what well, uh, well, what you think well, the narrative well, around well, Animo uh, is because I mean, I, yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from for sure. I'm going to uh, what was it called uh, when you're like a ghost writer? No, when you're like a writer under a pseudonym or something. So no one knows. A ghost writer. Ghost yeah, writer, ghost writer. Yeah. You got it the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're getting a plat chat ghost writer who writes the titles. <laughs> it's not going to be me anymore. So no one can blame me. It's going to be this magical person who writes them. Uh, no, but I think but I think it's a legitimate question. Um, sure. Because last season, Soul Dynasty at times. They, they had their struggles, you know, they were great in the regular season, you know, great record by all means. Um, but just 
watching Animal play at times, I think you could get the sense that uh, main support was one of Soul Dynasty's uh, issues uh, last season, and Animal didn't have the greatest of games uh, throughout all of last year, um, despite the fact that they had a great regular season records. Um, so I, I, I think it's I think it's a worthwhile question. While a lot of the league moves towards younger talent in tanks, DPS, um, a lot of contenders' talent being promoted, and Broder Mayhem decides to pick up. Like you said, like a 24-year-old main support, which in main support terms isn't that old. You know, we've had yeah. the tune around, etc. A lot of these True. veterans stay around the game. I mean, um, Moss is what, like 20, 28? I mean, actually, I did, does he actually? actually? No. no. There's, there's no way Moss is 28. Oh, it's 26. All right. Six, sorry. Yeah. All right. Um, there's, there's old. I mean, Neptuno, when he played, he was what, like 20? He was, was yeah. He, I, think I think he was Neptuno like 29 was 20. or something. I was like, yeah. I think Neptuno was actually 28. Yeah, Neptuno. Yeah, no, no, like he, he really so. was. I mean, he's he's definitely washed, but you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's twenty nine at the moment. Yeah, um, but but yeah, the, going back to the question, like Animo, I I think a lot of people raised their eyebrows, me included, when we saw that um, you signed Animo. It makes sense, as you said, that he could be a bit of a veteran on this team to you know bring the squad together. But it sounded like, from what you just said, that from a gameplay uh, scenario as well, like he he really proved that he. Uh, could figure out how Overwatch 2 worked in terms of like five versus five, spotting some of those plays open up. So t talk me a bit, uh, talk me through um, what you saw from Animo in tryouts and what you really see in him going into 2022. So we trialed a lot of main supports. Um, and I think from the rookies that we were trialing, some of the rookie talent, it seemed like they were just, they were very much, they had good mechanics, but they're very much stuck in like the Overwatch one. And they weren't like, they weren't actively trying to like use their brain to like work with Majed or work with the rest of the team and try to adapt their play style to kind of the new pacing. Um, like Brig is a little different in Overwatch 2 uh, without like armor packs and like you can use, like you can kill through Rally, you can be aggressive with Rally um, instead of, but anyways, that's just like one example. But like, I, I think for Automa, just like as we, as we played with them, it became clear that like he just performed the best out of all the supports um, that we try to pair with Majed on our team, and he kind of fit. Um, and, you know, everyone on our team kind of enjoyed playing with him and, and thought he was, like, a, a solid addition to the team. I think reading kind of, like, the feedback, you're like, oh, like, why not just get Moth, right? I think that was, like, one of the bigger... I think, honestly, Onimo is, like, a Korean version of Moth in many respects. Like, he's, you know, Moth also... I think people were just talking about how, like, oh, he was a little bit conservative last year. I mean, he barely played at all, right? Nobody, no, there's nobody saying like, oh, Moth is washed, right? At least the public narrative. Um, and Anmo played like a whole season last year. So I think, I don't know. I, I don't think he's washed at all. I think that was, um, we actually wanted to trial Moth. Um, didn't work out. Uh, but, you know, and we had to move on to, you know, we had to move on to our, our next, you know, our next options, right? Um, mm. But we, we trialed like pretty much every single main support reagent that you could think of like we either either we trialed them or uh, they declined or we we at least reached out to them so yeah, we, I mean, we trialed everyone yeah i mean the, the way i see it is like maybe you know my perception of how good animo is as a player is is wrong because you know i give you guys a lot of um not, not benefit of the doubt but like i trust you guys your scouting process and deciding to go with animo and i think that's uh very respectable so in that sense i'm looking forward to see how he performs in overwatch yeah. 2 uh based on this pickup alone so Th that excites me anyway. I think I, I a lot of say, people gone. Sorry. sorry, I said I, I will. I'll, I will say from the outside perspective, it is. I, I do understand why it's concerning. Like, oh, he's never playing on a mixed roster, right? Like, he's never. I, I think people, you know, don't. I mean, I, I think it's healthy skepticism. Like, oh, we don't really think he's gonna work out well on a mixed roster. That's outside perspective. But we scrim with him. He understands. Like, there's like Overwatch English, right? Like, I think the thing people have to understand is there's a difference between. Like being able to speak English and being able to speak Overwatch English, and yes. really for Overwatch, like all you need is Overwatch English, right? And then if you can understand that, and understand how to set up things, how to communicate with your team um, in Overwatch, that's that's the only English you really need. Um, but on, his English isn't that isn't isn't bad, um, and I, I think he has. It, it's kind of a time thing. So like as time goes on, his comms will get better as he gets more comfortable with the team. Um, but the baseline's already pretty promising from from what we saw in trials. I also just think. 
any kind of outside skepticism this season, frankly, about any roster is not going to be based in fact because it's a different game coming up. So it's yeah. very difficult to have strong opinions, actually, on any pickup because you don't really know what has gone on internally to select those players. And you don't know what the game looks like. I mean, none of us really know what the game looks like too, yeah. which is how we form our opinions. We form our opinions by looking at, oh, this player plays in a match and does x do we think that's right do we think that's wrong it's it's an unknown world that we're about to go into so it's just it's just interesting to see what what a blend of players some players getting their first starts on a team like yours especially such a young team with a lot of uh talent that you've plucked out of um contenders from various different regions and then also people who are getting fresh beginnings in some sense like animal where the story kind of gets a soft reset. It's, people will still remember how these kind of players played in Overwatch 1, but it won't really be relevant to how they actually perform a lot of the time, I feel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, Overwatch 1's like the baseline, but really, it's a new game. It doesn't really, I don't really care what you did in Overwatch 1, right? It's all about what I think you can do in Overwatch 2 and what you will do in Overwatch 2. Well, what? So what about Animo's flexibility then? Because that, you know, ties things back into your answer to the previous question where you were saying you wanted a main support that had flex support um, flexibility so that they would be able to pick up certain roles if it was required of them. From what I remember of Animo playing, he did not play too much of those roles in Overwatch 1. For, I don't think he was really required to play a bunch of, you know, BAP or Zen or something like that. Yeah. Well, um, I know that Moth had periods of time where he was like playing Zen in a double flex support, though not a huge amount, obviously. And you know, some of the some of the other main supports have had flirts with it as well. Animo, not so much from what I remember um, in matches. So, what does his flexibility currently look like? Is this a player that's ready to go right now, or somebody you're planning to develop into those kind of roles? Yeah. So he plays it. I mean, the answer to your question is that you're right. He he hasn't really played it in matches, um, but. We looked at his rank stats, we looked at his rank games, and he's, I don't know if it's this season or last season, but he played a bunch of Ana, um, and I think he was, like, top 10 on the support leaderboards at one time. Um, so I think mechanically, like, there's no reason, you know, I think mechanically he can he can play flex support at an owl level, you know, for, for a main support, like a secondary flex support. Um, I, whatever the most crucial flex support Majed will be the primary, right? Yeah. Um, but I think yeah. as a supporting... Or as a secondary flex support, I think the mechanics are, you know, I think the mechanics are, are going to be there for a rush too. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, one um, of the big, uh, go on, Jonathan. No, no, I was just going to move on, but you were the host. I remembered. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this next topic though, is one of the most interesting ones because the Florida mayhem for 2022 seems like it has a very different approach to some teams. And there's this broad idea of budget versus championship mentality. I feel where some teams are going the more cost effective route. I would say a budget has um, negative connotations. Like, like you said earlier, these are not just the scraps of players to pick up. But I think there is a stylistic difference between a Gunba-style roster, where it's like diamonds in the rough, you're trying to get uh, bang for your buck, you're trying to get cost-effectiveness, sure. versus just throwing money out there and picking up the best possible players, and hopefully they'll just win you a championship in Overwatch 2, even though it's a different game. So what what was your philosophy in terms of thinking about all right, th what kind of investment does Overwatch 2 and Overwatch League in 2022 merit? Yeah, um, so I, I will say the budget isn't... I, I get to control how I use the budget, but I would say the budget isn't... You know, I don't make the budget. Okay. I just like, okay, I'm given the budget, and then I have to figure out how to utilize that budget or how best to, how best to deploy the budget. Um, so I think going in, it was just, it was about cost effectiveness this year. Um, like there were certain players where there's a point where we can't, you know, we can't bid anymore, right? Like we have a hard cap. Whereas for other teams, it's like they can go as high, you know, they'll keep going. They'll yeah. keep going, they'll keep going. And then they'll be like, okay, now it's like we're, you know, in the in six figures, like we're at 200, we're at 300. Um, and then they just have, end up having two, like two teams with like huge war chests competing. Um, and it's like, they have the same offer. It just, just depends on, up to the player like which team they want to choose right um so i think for us there were certain there was a number of those players that basically were out of our price range just from the get-go 
Um, and so I think it really, it really allowed us to kind of focus on, hey, how do we make the best roster knowing that we can't go after, you know, the highest ticket players on the market? Um, it was like, let's look at this from a global perspective, right? And I think the answer was, we can't limit ourselves to one region. We have to look at every single region. Look at China, look at Korea, look at, you know, we didn't get a Chinese player, but we were looking at some Chinese players um, as part of the scouting process. We're looking at EU, we're looking at, um, you know, NA contenders like everywhere, um, Australia. So it was, let's start from, have a very wide view and then start narrowing it down based on, hey, like, bang for the buck, like who who's giving us more for the money, right? Is it, we definitely, not not to say we had anything, I don't think this is anything similar to like the Valium situation that Gumbo was in. Um, we were, we're not on like shoestring budget here. Like we're still paying players decent salaries. It's just not, you know, we're not paying like super team level salaries. Um, some, some, of these, right. yeah, yeah. some of these organizations out there, right? Like I'm sure, you know, no surprise that Shanghai's payroll is going to be much larger than our payroll, um, to give an example. So yeah, we we're looking at players that may have been overlooked, um, may have, and, and trying to identify those early, because earlier we identify them before other teams kind of get further along the trial process and kind of go through, as I said, as they go through their, okay, our first option, we lost a bidding war, right? Our second option could be another bidding war. Third option could also be a bidding war. And then they kind of work their way down and they're like, okay, well, now we have to settle. So instead of, for us, it was working our way from the, from like the bottom to the top, like in reverse order. It's like, okay, let's eliminate everyone that we're like for sure we don't want and then kind of work our way up to like, here are realistic pieces that we can get right now. They might be more expensive later on down the road, but we've identified them earlier than other teams um, because we're coming at it from a different uh, from a different lens than like, hey, these are all the best players. Let's just start from top to bottom, yeah, which is I think yeah. most of what the other teams do. Mm. Yeah. Do you feel like do you feel like this upcoming season it puts your team at a disadvantage not having the enormous war chest? Um I don't think so cuz I think Overwatch 2 will be I think it's a it's a completely new game. There's no like baseline. Everyone is going to have like a few the same few months to adapt and I think the first season of any new game is going to be who adapts the quicker, the quickest doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the best team in the long run, but at least for the first inaugural season, I say inaugural season, but inaugural season is Overwatch 2. <laughs> yeah. Um, inaugural 2. <laughs> it's going to be, it, it's going to be who, ad who learns the fastest, like who adapts the fastest. And then that's going to be who, who's good. And I think you saw that in the beginning, like in the beta of Overwatch 1, like the, the teams that were good, most of them weren't good later on in the game like two years down the line like those team those same teams that were like dominant in like the beta like they you know they weren't the same so i th i think i think it's going to be a lot closer is my point for for a rush too so no i don't i don't think I, don't, I think of all the years to kind of like go from hey you had like some more money last year to you know your budget's a little tighter this year i think this is the year where you you can be very competitive on on a budget yeah, it feels to me like this is the year kind of to like uh, set the foundation and a lot of teams is, are, are doing this. Um, I mean, you've been working as a general manager for like uh, three years now, Lord Mayhem. Were, were you a manager, general manager like straight off the bat? when you? No, I was, an, I was an analyst when I yes. came in. Um, yes, I remember yeah. seeing you in that practice room in, in Burbank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah at our, I came in. God, those practice rooms were so small and cramped. and <laughs> No windows. Yeah, uh, we had a yeah. weird setup too. It was like a classroom. It was interesting how people set up their... Anyway, going off topic, but like, yeah, there's everyone that had their fun, setups. Fun, yeah. Everyone had their room set up like differently, um, and I thought that was that was pretty interesting. But we opted for like a classroom style setup. I think I was in like the corner by the Keurig, um, because I was like the <laughs> analyst. <laughs> I just it's like a gremlin in the corner of the practice room, like <laughs> like typing up reports and stuff. But yeah, fun fun times. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and here you are now, general manager of, of the Florida Mayhem. Um, yeah. We don't really talk to a lot of like general managers, you know, on, on, on plat chat and what goes into that job, et cetera. Um, how, how do you really uh, manage expectations and goals for the Florida Mayhem when it comes to budgeting like that? Um, you know, different seasons have different um, different things impacting it. For example, like 2020, it was, you know, the, the COVID season, you didn't know that going into it, but you had a bunch of different elements going into it that, um, you can necessarily prepare for. Um, 2022, you got Overwatch 2 coming out. Who knows what that's going to mean for the roster, the game, etc. Uh, how do you as a 
general manager really like prepare for these different seasons? How do you manage expectations for the team? Um, and, and what is reasonable that you can like go to your boss and be like, hey, we, we reached all, all the all the goals this season. We crossed all the boxes, you know, we did good. Um, how, how do you manage those expectations as a general manager and, and budgeting for the year? I, I will say it's much more of an art than a science um, because, you know, I, I think there's so many factors, there's so many different things. Um, and it change. I think that's the that's the thing I love the most about this job is it's different every year. Like every year I'm learning something new, I'm learning something, you know, last year, learned a lot of things last year, um, even though we didn't do great, but it's like every year, it's like, let's let's try to build a better team. No matter what, you know, no matter if I, if I have less resources or more resources, like the goal is always to learn from learn from the last season and build, you know, build better for for the upcoming season. Um, and I so so I think just having the job's always different. The job's always exciting every off season. Um, so this one, you know, we were full Korean the last two years. This year, we're full mixed. Um, and I think just understanding like you know, establishing boundaries, like how how many Koreans do we have? Like, is there a max number of Koreans? You know, like what what does the head coaching look like? Um, and kind of talking talking through it with like Ben, like and John, like when we're setting the budget, it's like okay, so it's gonna be a rush two next year, but like the retail version's probably not gonna be out, right? Like we kind of knew that beforehand. Like we had an inkling, like probably not gonna happen. Also, given you know, then like the Blizzard scandal stuff happened, and then it was like okay, well, for sure, like. There's no way a rush two is going to be the retail version is going to be out. Like, effect, how does that affect like how much we want to invest in the team for next year? Um, also, like balancing that with other initiatives at Misfits, right? Like, I I think my budget's like not in a vacuum. Like, it's not just this is our Overwatch budget. It's like there's like the Overwatch budget. There's like a Rocket League budget. There's like and it's all kind of like interconnected. There's like this the um the content creators. Like everything's kind of connected, and it's like it's not just when, when we talk budget and we talk about like how much we're investing, it's not just the overwatch, right? Like it's, it's everything's connected. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think as I've kind of, I guess it's deviating away from overwatch in a way, but like, as I've kind of climbed kind of the ladder here and climbed up the ranks um, at, at misfits, like it's, it's been like understanding like the larger picture, right? Understanding, even though overwatch is like, it's always going to be like my passion, um, but just like understanding each year, like understanding more of the business side and kind of the industry, having an industry-wide view on like what's going on and like how that affects my team, um, how it affects Overwatch, how it affects what I recommend for the budget, how it affects like oh you know how much do I think I can get for the budget? What are the justifications? Like what under what circumstances would make sense for me to ask more for certain positions than? than so others? not only talking about Florida then, do you, like just talking about general managing and teams in general. Yeah. Like um, for example, like Dallas Fuel, you know they had their their troubles for a long time trying yeah. to sort out their roster and trying to be successful and then one season they're just like we're, we're going full korean where right. you know we're, we're picking up all of these great players and this is the year we're really like gunning for the title and they came so close <laughs> i mean they really did come so close to winning the title um but you would say that is like part of the art form you have to like spot like your window uh like this is the time for us to go big um right this opportunity to win and then maybe like i don't know you look at this is not your job but someone's job is to be like, hey, probably should allocate some more budget to Valorant. They seem to be doing good. And then it's like a little bit less for Overwatch, but then Overwatch 2 came out. So I, I guess there's a lot of planning that goes into um, a general manager's job even there when it comes to like, you know, time horizon, like now's the time to build a foundation. This will, you know, 2023 might be the year where you, you try to push some extra budget in to uh, yeah. really create that championship team, et cetera. So... Is that sort of what it's looking like as a general manager on that time horizon, spotting those windows when you can really go and win? Yeah, I mean, it's also kind of like if you know you have to move on from a player, for example, for us this offseason, it was Yaki, right? It's like, is there yeah. a way where we can maximize? Like, there's that was a probably window. a big headache, you know? Right, like, there's a window, right? Like, I would love to keep Yaki, but if we can't, like, what's the best way for him to get what he wants and for us to get, you know, for, for us to kind of get some more budget from you know selling him to yeah, yeah. you know to to reinvest that into the roster right or to get to have a larger budget than we otherwise would have if we just let him go as a free agent right so is there a way to get both um is the window there like it's just, luckily for us like his stock was still you know very high um could be a different story right if he didn't have a good season last year i mean he did 
we as a team didn't have a good season, but like him individually, like I think everyone was still like, okay, he's yeah. still like the guy. Like he's yeah. still yeah. a top five DPS player in the world. If we didn't have that, you know, we're being it would be a different conversation um, in the off season. But since we did have that, it was like, okay, we have a window here where we have a very valuable asset that we can sell and turn into, um, you know, turn into more turn into players, right? Yeah. Just my my final question on the 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 budget ideas and that kind of stuff for Overwatch League 2022. With the teams that are throwing around the large war chests, do you think that's sensible for next season? Um, I mean, I guess it depends There's on... There's friends, Josh. Gotta throw them under the bus. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not saying that to try and throw them under the bus. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm saying from your point of view, you know more about the inner workings than we do. And there is a big divide i mean there yeah. is a divide that some teams are approaching this very differently and and your organization is one of them that's taken a very different approach to uh, for example i mean shanghai dragons are retaining their team so that's not yeah. even really the same that's not really what i'm meaning but the teams that are splashing the cash to to go hard in the first year of overwatch 2 um and again the context being you can't really know how good your team is going to be because you can't run tryouts on the game currently so uh the, there does seem to be a mentality divide there. Do, what do you think it's sensible to invest a lot this year? I think I think it depends on what your goals are, and I think it's hard for me to comment on if it makes sense if I don't know the underlying reasoning. Because I think every team's different, right? Like I think spending I'm just gonna make a number, but like spending 300k, for example, on super is much different than spending 300k on a player that doesn't have the platform that super has, right? Of like course, you could spend 300k on a Korean like superstar that doesn't stream. And then it's like, well, the value depends on what your goals are, right? Like if say, for example, it was, it's a Shanghai player that you're paying 300 K for and they win the championship. Is that worth it? Was that as worth as getting super for 300 K and him, you know, you benefiting off of his stream numbers, like his, his, his like content creation as an org. Um, I think there's very different, you know, th those are all like things you have to weigh and balance um and there's also at the end of the day there's only one team can win right only one team out yeah. of 20 yeah. is going to win every season so most most of the teams that are spending crazy money aren't actually the only one of them is going to win it um mm -hmm. so then it's like are there other factors that make sense right like do they do they need to do well this season why do they need to do well this season like did they think that this was their window to win the championship um what does a championship mean to them like financially right like is it we don't really care if we're, you know, deep, deep in the red, as long as we win a championship. Like for some, like there's owners that are like that. Like, I don't, you know, it's just, this is just fun for them. Right. It's just like, okay, like, let's, I will spend as much money as I want or as I can, like, just, you know, get me a, give me a championship. Right? I, I mean, Hasbro has literally tweeted that kind of stuff before. He right. said that he just wants more trophies. He does seem to have that kind of mentality when it comes to it. A very, very old school mentality, I would say, yeah. of, of being trophy focused first. I'm sure there's other people in the finance department who have different ideas about yeah. that. But <laughs> like, I, I think there's some teams that are like, okay, we will be in the red. And we will try to be as competitive as possible, grow like a, a a fan base, maybe collect a trophy or two, and then like collect more sponsors that way. Like maybe they think that's their strategy. It's like we have to win to be relevant. Other teams are like, okay, well, it's kind of expensive to be running a playoff or like a championship contending team every you know, year over year. Let's look at some other ways to be relevant. Like I don't know, like Vancouver, uh, the breadsticks, right? Like <laughs> even though they were like one of the worst teams, like their breadsticks like activation went crazy. Yeah, I don't know. It didn't seem like it, it seemed like serendipitous that it actually happened, but like I don't think that was planned. It was just like wow, it just kind of organically just popped off, right? But it's yeah. like I think serendipity can, is the perfect word to describe that. <laughs> yeah, and it's like so you can be relevant while still being a very bad team competitively, mm. right? Do, like I don't know the finances. Like I don't know if Pizza Hut like re up their deal for you know five hundred thousand or so. Like I have no idea, but. <laughs> I, I hope mean, so. I just but I'm sure Pizza Hut was happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the idea of a marketing manager at Vancouver or a sales yeah. manager at like Vancouver Talents just like pitching Pizza Hut and then it's like, hey, we got Pizza Hut and then just like, holy fuck, we got Pizza Hut. Red <laughs> yeah. Sticks is the shit. And I don't know. Someone just got really happy in the Vancouver Talents yeah. department. And I'm happy for that person. I don't I, I don't think yeah. I know you, but I'm I'm happy for you. <laughs> he, she, right, well, they. Uh, just good, good job on the breadsticks meme.
Love yeah. Al- Albert, what, what would you say Florida's goals are for 2022? We've discussed a little bit about different organizations having different goals, and it's just a reality. Uh, in a franchise league, you don't always have to be, you know, constantly striving for the number one position or uh, trying to avoid relegation or something like that. So people have different different goals heading into the year. With this roster that um, is underneath Gumber and you've tried to select the best talent that you could for the price point, uh, what what are the goals? Um, underdog team that with a lot of punching power um, and a, like a very high potential skill ceiling. If we if we hit that, like we could be very dangerous. Um, but I, I think it's just the end of the day. Like I wanted to get a very exciting team, and I think we have that. Like on paper, we have a very exciting team. Like there's elements, you know, multiple countries, multiple storylines there. Like a few vets, a lot of hungry rookies, um, and just I think every every match. I want it to be like is a must watch, I think. And I think if we can if we get that we can be like an exciting team no matter what, um I think, you know, we, we would have succeeded. I think last year, even though we were supposed to have like a, a good team on paper, I wouldn't necessarily say people were you know, towards the end at least, people weren't excited about like a Florida Mayhem match, right? Whereas I think for this it's like, can they do it? Can they you know, is Hydron gonna pop off? Is is checkmate gonna be like the new Yaki, right? Like and then We'll, we'll kind of see, like, is Majed, really, you know, is Majed going to kill everyone on low ping? Like, I think there's so <laughs> many, you know, yeah. there's there's so many things there. There's so many things of interest. There's so many, like, there's something for everyone on our roster. And I think that was, like, that's kind of our my goal for building the roster in 2022. And hopefully, like, the fans feel the same way. We'll see. Um, you know, definitely will help if we're a very good team. Um, okay. But- that always I got, is I got, going to help, yeah. I got, I got one last meme question. Just yeah. a bit off topic, but I know you're a great basketball fan. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, you, you, you'd you upload your videos, your ball in, hitting three-pointers, all that good stuff. You follow the NBA. We, we've mentioned that on Twitter yeah. before. <laughs> if Florida Mayhem 2022 was the basketball team in the NBA, which, which franchise would you like in yourself to? Are you like the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Memphis Grizzlies, looking at the NBA teams, wh- yeah. wh- which one do you like yourself uh, the most? I'd say Grizzlies. I think that, yeah. but not like this year Grizzlies, but like the next gen. It's like when they first, so I think, God, what year was it? Basically the year John Morant came in and they had a bunch of like older vets and he basically just had like a coup and just like kicked them all. I was like, you know, it's like, it's time for like the new generation of like Memphis Grizzlies. Um, Grizz next gen, I think is what it was, what it's called. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel like our team is i know I, this goes way above the head of so many viewers but i, I just find, it, I find it really yeah i find it i find it really entertaining so okay uh i'll i'll, I'll be looking at i'll be looking at hydron as like the john morant of uh, the overwatch league next season oh we need to we need to play i don't know he's challenging me to one on one he thinks he thinks he'll win so we'll see what, oh, hydron. oh, there's yeah. going to be a Hydron v the general manager <laughs> basketball 1v1. Is that for like, is there, is there some salary bonus on the line or something? No, I think it's just pride. I mean, I don't know. If he gets beat by a 29-year-old man, like he just, I don't know. Maybe he would be benched for like a stage. There's a lot of pride <laughs> in basketball, yeah. <laughs> Does he have the height advantage? Does he, has, has he played a lot? What's, what's the story he, there? He claims he's six foot, but like, I don't really care about height like i don't know we'll see he was like oh i played in new york or he's from new york i'm like whatever that's- right right oh but he's, wow. yeah. he's only he plays like in the outdoor he i don't know he was like he, he plays in the parks is what he said he's like a park player okay um, so like an out but like i play indoors so we'll see I, it we'll makes see. me want to it makes me want to get back outside i um check out this shooting for man it is it's actually dope. it's actually lovely i yeah. is this a this is a sponsored segment as well is it <laughs> no no so that that's just the app I use to record. It's oh, not sponsored I or anything, see. but like it's a way to track shots. Um, I, I think it's only for iOS, but yeah, not sponsored, but it's great. It's free. You just set up a, set it up on a tripod, and make sure it has a view of the whole court, and then it automatically tracks your shots and gives you like heat maps and percentages and and everything. Wow. It's like a super super nifty app. That's actually sick. I love yeah. that. I, <laughs> that. That's really cool. Yeah. I'm uh, all right. Well, I'm gonna be checking that out afterwards. Should have been a sponsor segment because you, you sold me on it. Can your videos, Josh? <laughs> can we see some yeah. of your shooting? 
No, it, it works on think, any court. You can do it outdoors, indoors, like whatever. Yeah, I don't think I have any line. videos of me playing. Um, the Bren did record a video of uh, like a comedy video of him deliberately fucking up many, many times. <laughs> but I can tell you, I can't shoot six three pointers in a row. I can tell you that for a fact. I can, I can maybe hit one out of six, but even that would be pretty good for me. Yeah, I'm so, more of a defensive rebounder guy. Uh, I That's, yeah, I I'm I'm willing to get in there and. And fuck people up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Avast told me you guys play basketball all the time. We we did play basketball quite a lot, but as the nights have gotten darker here, um, I just haven't gone out. I, oh, I don't think I've played you guys since are like October. Players. What's okay. right? You guys are outdoor players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. I need to. I, I'm going back to the UK in a couple of days, so I need to find some people. It, it's not a particularly popular sport, there, though, in yeah. Britain. No. So. I was going to say, are there, are there many courts in the UK? In, in the US, yeah, it's like there's no, courts there's a everywhere. shit ton of courts. Oh, there are like, okay. All of the gyms have indoor basketball courts. All really? of them do. Okay. But that's just because there are big courts, and you just put some lines on the floor, and then you use it for anything else that you want. You know, people use it for soccer, mostly. Don't, and you, then, don't you play netball in the UK? Mmm... Netball is somewhat popular in schools, but it's mostly a women's sport. I've uh, never personally played netball, but it does seem kind of interesting. I always, we always used to get rolled by the shooters from the netball teams because they were better shots <laughs> than our basketball players. Because <laughs> there's no backboard for them. They have to get it straight in the first time. Um, anyway, God, we've gone way off tangent, but I enjoyed the That's discussion. Fun. Um, yeah. let's talk about some news. We'll get, we'll get some of your thoughts. I'll get some of Jonathan's sure. thoughts as well. Um, on, I think the biggest news piece of the recent weeks, uh, obviously we missed last week as well, is that Washington Justice replaced Fury with Kalios. So Fury was, I think everyone was expecting him to be one of their starting tanks after, you know, a long history of being a great player and a very flexible player as well. Um, again, yeah. historically been a player that could pick up DPS at any point, kind of a player that you would want in that position that you feel is capable of playing uh, many different roles. And instead, they've got Kalios. Jonathan, what are your opening thoughts with this? Where does, where does this oh. move the needle on the Washington Justice for you? I, I, need, I, need, I need to write up a Washington Justice rant. <laughs> I, I really do. Like, okay. um, you know, because they, they sent him off and um, I, I think some of the comments from the GM and Fury himself was like that he, um, he wanted to spend more time in Korea, um, you know, with his family. He yeah. uh, uh, spent some time on Philadelphia Fusion, on the Washington Justice. So he's been in the States for a very long time throughout pretty much the entirety of COVID. Um, I mean, I'm also, sure. has he not just been in, uh, in NA since like early 2018? Yeah, because London, he was here as well in LA. Yeah, right? so... I so, I, I don't think he's ever had a significant portion of time to really spend back in Korea. Yeah, so that's, you know, very understandable. Um, I mean, four years in the States, uh, I, th I think that amount of time you have every right in the world to just be like, hey, you know, it's time for me to probably go back to Korea, spend more time with my family, especially, you know, having gone through an entire pandemic, stuff like that. So um, it's very understandable. It just like... As, as someone who who just like wants to will this Washington Justice team to be good, it pains me. As a as a fan of what this could have been, it, it's sad mm. that that this is the way um, it's happened. Because Kalios, yeah, you're good. You know, came into the New York Excelsior uh, middle of the season, helped them out, uh, made the tank line look pretty respectable. So liked what I saw from him. But we're talking about Fury, okay? Like a, a top three off tank in Overwatch One. So him, Decay, Mag, we hardly knew ya. It's all already over. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes in Overwatch Two. But man, as someone who just wanted this group of players to really come together and be sick and compete for the title, it didn't really happen. And now we'll see if they figure it out with Kalios, Mag, and. Is Fury? Are you, sorry, I've I've gotten so distracted there by your comment. A top three off tank in Overwatch One history. It's now that we're at the end of Overwatch One, we can start making statements like that, and they will carry weight. Is he top three? I mean, obviously he's a legend of the scene, but yeah, it's like do you, do you put him over Choi, Hanbin, Void. Yeah, those are the three that come to mind for me: Choi, Void, and then Hanbin. I think, and Fury would have to overtake. To me, probably Hanbin, maybe, he'd have yeah. to overtake because Choi and Void have been playing longer and potentially done more. Would, would you have him in there, Jonathan? You think he's yeah. top three? 
No, I mean, I said top three to not cause any ruckus. I was about to say that he was the best, but had I said it, he was the best, it would have been one of those comments I do where I just like say it without really thinking of, you know, how that's going to go over on yeah. Reddit. So yeah, yeah. I was like, I'll be respectable. I'll say top three. And apparently that's that's not enough for you. It, would you would you have wanted me to say top I, five? Fury top five? That would have been disrespectful. I think you could safely say he's top five. I think top three requires some careful thought, actually. In my opinion. What do you think, Albert? Okay, but I don't th I don't think he's close. I think Fury, looking at the entire Overwatch One history, what, the five years it, it was out. I, I think Fury without a shadow of a doubt has had a more uh, Are you talking about more accolades than Humbin? So you're not talking about just Owl then. You're talking about yeah, I'm talking about the five years. I mean, if you know? you're talking about five years, you are only talking about Owl, though, because Fury didn't really do anything prior to Owl. He wasn't no, like a big guy in Apex or anything like that. Choi Obin yeah, sure, but had Choi and Void He both, won yeah. the league with Lola Spitfire. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. I mean, you're making good arguments. I'm not saying he isn't top three. I'm yeah. saying that the, it's a discussion to be had, right? I, it's, I, 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 I think top three is like a... You can, you can talk about him being top three. Like, I don't think that's outlandish, um, but I think top five would be like a safe, you know... Say top five, like nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna be All like, right. oh, is he top five? Like, okay, <laughs> yeah, top just, five. All right. I, I enjoy Ribbon Jonathan, but I also do enjoy clarifying statements like that. And I also think they're just fun topics for us to do in the yeah. off season too. Yeah. If we did, you know, top five off tanks of the, uh, of, of the, I mean, we discussed doing like a top 100, Albert, of, of Overwatch 1, like top 100 players of Overwatch 1, which would be a mammoth task to I mean, undertake. But if you broke it down by roles, it wouldn't be too crazy. You could do like- We're not breaking it down by roles. Okay, he's laying. The, he's putting his we're foot down. We're doing it one to a hundred. What is this like? Like the top seventy, yep. the NBA seventy-five. We're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of controversy. It's gonna oh, be. Really? I mean, you could make a list like that without controversy. It would be. Yeah. It would be that's impossible. What we need. Okay, I'm going on comp competitive Overwatch subreddit every single day. Today is Monday. The front page still has post on it from Friday. There's <laughs> no one I doing mean, anything. I mean, it's dead it's right just now. Quiet. I mean, I mean, it's also December. Like. It's, you know, it's not a real month. December is just not a real month. It's just, yeah. it's holiday season. Everyone's just, everyone's finishing up their work and... Anyway, trying to I have home. a hot take though. Yeah. I have a hot take for you. That okay. might be hotter than uh, than the, the Fury discussion, actually. <laughs> in terms of his legacy. Which is... I, mean, I want to pose it as a question, not as a take, actually. Are you confident that Fury would be a better tank player than Kalios in Overwatch 2? Because I'm not confident. To me, the range bars are too large because of the unknown factors. To the point where you're, you're I'm really a not confident. You're fucking eel. Because now you're like <laughs> pouring yourself into this like this kind of thought pattern. Where it's like, well, we don't know what Overwatch 2 is going to be like. But so we don't. How can we, definitively we really say don't. We, we don't. We don't know, I, do we? Palios is also like a, a, a bit of a ranked demon. He's got the mechanics. He actually performed well in, in recent yeah, history in the Overwatch League. He looked good. I'm not confident that this is a downgrade because... I don't know what the fuck the tank roll looks like, but I can't be confident that it's something to be upset about as a Washington fan. And we still have Mag. Only one. At the end of the day, like even if you had Mag and Fury, only one of them can play Overwatch two at true. any given time. Very true. Like, like it's you're, you're not having Mag and Fury in the server. You're having either Mag or Fury. Okay. So How... I, I think the yeah. question really is for Fury and Kalios, like. I guess it depends on the role, right? If Kalios can also play main tanks, maybe he's more flexible option. If you're gonna throw an off tank, like an off tank with capability of flexing a main tank in the server, if they're just only playing off tanks, like then you know maybe there's more of an argument, like okay, Fury's probably the better off pure off tank. But like I I don't know, like without knowing how they're gonna be utilized, and I don't even think Justice knows how. Like I don't even know how you know we're necessarily gonna utilize our tanks yet, um, because we have sure, two as well. Sure. So it's like, I, I don't know, that question is just, I have no idea. Um, But I also think translating that tweet about, like, I don't know, I, I no longer look at, I wish I could look at tweets like the way a fan would, because then it's like, oh, it's like, it's so simple. It's like, oh, Fury, better player. Like, I'm sad Fury's gone, right? Like, to me, but when I when I read tweets, it's like, Fury, it seems like Fury did not want to be in DC anymore. Mm. He wanted to play out of APAC, and he found, you know, and it says, continues Overwatch career. And if he was on the Justice and the release, this isn't a release. Like I'm sure they got a buyout for him for some team in the APAC region. 
this is yeah, what this presumably reads to me. yeah yeah because otherwise so you wouldn't like, be sure that he's continuing his career yeah right absolutely. yeah it's his continue so like he, he he's on a team somewhere and that paid a buyout for him um so i you know, like that's what i read i read into this fury wanted to leave they got a buyout for him um they got Callius, but it's like i don't know exactly where that money went like was it allocated on you know into other for other players as well <laughs> Right. Allocated like, to keep decay. <laughs> is it <laughs> decay? Decay had like a to keep him 100K, on the roster. Hundred like, K like kicker. It's 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 hush money, so he doesn't piss people off in scrims. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm just I, I I struggle to view things through the. I, I don't really know what the fan response to this was because I've been out of the loop for the last two weeks. I've been doing the Valorant stuff, yeah. but I imagine if I had to guess, the fan response would be pretty negative about this because Fury's right. a very beloved player. So yep. I was just putting the question out there because I imagine the emotional response for a lot of people is, oh, fuck. But I don't know how much that's actually accurate. I don't know how much that I'll actually translate. I feel like Kalios is a pretty decent, a, de a, a pretty good choice to try and get as like your off-tank specialist that might be able to transition into other roles if Fury didn't want to play for the team. No. Yeah, I mean to clarify, I don't, I don't think you know. I'm, a, I'm a ex isolating the incident. I'm excited about Kalios joining the team because I genuinely want to see what he can do with this team. You know, playing tank with Decay and Assassin, for example, uh, because of what he showed us on the New York Excelsior. I, I just, I, I just mentioned my sadness about the team that came into this season, 2021, with all these high expectations. Where we're mm. like, well. It's the Gladiators, it's the Shock, and then there's Washington Justice, and they will be like the top three teams. And then we had the fucking Clown Fiesta, which was the Washington Justice <laughs> this year, and that, that entire story. Um, and so I, I guess I just kind of wanted them to be like this elite team that made like top four um, mm. in, in, in the playoffs um, eventually, and that just didn't happen. So I'm, I'm not... I'm 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 not mad at Washington Justice, you know. I'm not frustrated with the team or anything. It's just kind of sad that you know this is how um, that kind of mix of players uh, go separate ways after what was uh, supposed to be a very hype season from them going into it. So yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but I, I'm happy. I'm happy about Kalios. You know, I, I think he's a decent talent. I get where you're coming from here as well. All right, next piece of news though there was this week was Admiral being promoted to London Spitfire from Hurricane, and the uh, London Spitfire have actually got a, a, a pretty advanced roster together. Again, off the top of my head, I should have looked this up earlier, but they they have fully fleshed out their positions, have they not? Yeah. We got two tanks, two supports, three DPS. Uh, yeah. You know, according to what I'm seeing here anyway. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty complete. I, I think a lot of people, you know, I, I have some close on Spitfire fans in my... Uh, <laughs> In my Discord, uh, people who I interact with, and essentially what I've been hearing from them for the past few months, were essentially like, just promote Admiral to this team. Please, someone promote Admiral. Um, because they were so hype about him uh, getting a chance in, in the Overwatch League. So I think there's been a long time coming. But, you know, maybe Admiral, being a main support, had some offers from other teams uh, trying out some main supports. Uh, I, I wouldn't know. Um, but I, I think this is a pretty exciting signing for uh, uh, Lone Spitfire because a lot of fans of the British Hurricane has been impressed with him in contenders. They also promoted their entire British Hurricane squad who were all doing well, and it didn't go well for them in the Overwatch League at all. So I'm... This time it's different, Josh. Yes, this time it's different. How? <laughs> no, I, it isn't a full team. It is definitely a mixture, and they have more... I mean, the, the veteran talent of Poco, for example, and I actually do believe in their coaching staff as well. I think Christopher's a good coach. Um, but it does feel to me like London Spitfire have again limited themselves very heavily by extracting only European talent. And that is their... That, I mean, that is their vision. That's their brand. That's what they want to do. But I can't help but feel that it's going to limit them. Um... And, it, and this isn't a statement about Admiral at all, but just the team overall looks... I mean, they've got some decent talent, but I feel like they're still going to be struggling to get up out of the... Um, out of the 
messy bottom of the table kind of area and start pushing further and further up. I think that's going to be a, a challenge for this team. Do you have any experience with some of these players, Albert, from like holding tryouts? Um, you know, there's a few different contenders, talents on here. Um, even like Hadi, for example, who initially, you know, uh, departed the team and then he came back like a month later. Admiral Provide, who played for yeah. Maryville for a bit. Like, do you have any experience with any of these players? Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of them in our in our trials. Um, a good number of them were in our trials and familiar with the players. I think, I mean, I think Admiral's a fine pickup. Uh, I think you have to look at like what's available at the time and who's you know who's available and, they, and who they chose. Uh, who they chose them over. Um, I don't know. I don't want to like name players or anything, but I think it's a fine. I think it's 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 a pick that makes sense, and it's also their only academy promotion this year, right? Um, if that's correct. Uh, yes, I don't yeah, believe because the others Provide were came from Marvel from... and Backbone came from Altiora. So, yeah, and yeah. then Poco, you know, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I I can't really fault them on Spitfire either. To your point, Sideshow, about them, you know, being picking up all this European talent, because I think for a long time people were like missing that team in the Overwatch League, which yeah. was like, okay, well, Paris, London. We're waiting. Like, where, where are our yeah. European um, contenders' talent teams? Because I, it definitely was at the, at the first couple of years. It was just like no one was really looking at European contenders and the talent that was available in that region. I mean, Philly um, had a bunch so. of them actually. I mean, season. Yeah, one, I mean that was, was a team, up. I suppose. You know, That's true. yeah, with EQO, uh, Boombox. Well, Mayhem was Poco. European for a while. Oh yeah, I forgot about that's, that. Yeah, that's also true. That's <laughs> that, that's absolutely true. I mean, Glads, I, Glads as well. I think though you you're you're, yeah. you're towing a delicate line when you do stuff like the London Spitfire here because the the idea is you want to bring in all of these European fans, but the European fans also don't want to be supporting a team that gets trounced all season and then the region itself looks like a joke. You know, if you're from Europe, you don't want a team that's going to get battered and then people just go EU or Megal all uh, all the time. And I didn't think that was going to happen with the Hurricane squad when it was promoted. They actually looked... I, I thought they looked pretty decent in contenders, and I thought that Tankline had some uh, pretty decent um, ceiling that they could have improved to, but it just went so, so horribly wrong. Um, I, yeah. I think the question is always, like, with all these good contenders teams, like, depending on the region, like, can they make can they make the leap, right? There, there, is, a, there is a leap from contenders to AL, um, at least in some of these other regions. I think Korea... Like Korean contenders to a lesser extent, I don't know if there's much of a leap. It's kind of you know if you're doing really well in Korean contenders, you're probably going to do fine in the league. Um, but even then, there's still been like a few players, like prodigy level players from Korea that haven't panned out in in Al. Um, so yeah. I think we're going. But I think for whole teams, at least from regions, like I th you have to be careful. Like if you pick up a whole team, like well, probably only some of them can make that leap um, to Al. And I think for if you're limiting yourself to European supports, I like, on the Admiral pickup, like what what other kind of EU supports were out there? I guess there's like Dala and FD God, right? Those are those people are wanting to see FD God land somewhere. I mean, doesn't seem like he's found a spot. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I guess you have to give Lono Spitfire benefit. Of the doubt here, the, the, there is a point to be made about surrounding your talent, though, with um, experienced veterans and like promoting that kind of talent and uh, trying to make it work for them. And I mean, that's where your animal pickup makes a ton of sense for the Florida Mayhem as well. Just like, yo, here's a veteran who's been around the Overwatch League forever, been on some great teams, for example, New York Excelsior early on, um, and 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 knows has that experience. Um, he can coach some of these younger players as well. Uh, Ron Spitfire last year they had Kellex. Even though it spent some time in contenders this year, they have Poco um, and Shax to an extent. You know, a bit of a veteran in the Overwatch League, so it's about um, you know promoting some of these contenders' talent, but also making a, a good environment for them to uh, succeed in. Yeah, so, yeah. Poco is certainly close. the most experienced player that they've had, though. Yeah. It's a real tier yeah. above the rest in terms of the, his experience in playing on a team that did extraordinarily well as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's like, what's the point of having an academy team if you don't promote from your academy team, like? This is the whole sure. point of having an academy team to develop talent for your main team. Sure. Absolutely. And if and if you're always signing talent that isn't in your academy team, like why, you know, why aren't those players in your academy team, right? Like, yeah. yeah. What's going on there? 
All right, let's move on to our final piece of news. It is the uh, Valiant. So the Valiant have finally come out of their slumber, and they are making uh, making announcements. Here we go. They signed No Hill and Wu Hyal for the coaching staff, and there are also rumors about some players as well. So I'm, you want me to we'll, just mention them? Or? Uh, yeah, we'll 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 dive around. Go on then, Jonathan. What do you want to talk about with Valiant? Uh, oh no, I just wanted to bring up the rumored players as well, just to give some yeah. background. Yeah, give some background. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is all Halo of Thoughts, and you know, it, it seems to be doing a decent job this offseason nailing most of the stuff. So, yeah. thank you for what you will, but it's rumored from Halo. Uh, so, DI is rumored to be picked up, uh, Innovation, and Becky. So, that's three DPS players for you. And then today, the day of recording, Monday, I think he mentioned as well that Coldest, the former Hangzhou uh, support, like support player, um, will mm. get picked up by Valiant. So, picking up, um, you know, No Hill. And who y'all for this team? I think a lot of people are waiting for No Hill to get picked up after uh, his success in contenders. Lance in Valiant, um, hopefully not with that roster we're seeing on the screen right there, uh, <laughs> but picking up some of this uh, yeah. this very skilled uh, contenders talent. Suddenly Valiant, they might become this, you know, um, underdog uh, punching upwards in the APAC region, uh, packing a punch. I, I, I'm quite excited to see if if these if these rumors ring true. And you got a pretty decent coaching staff, like announced here with No Hill and Who Y'all. I'm I'm not gonna sleep on the Valiant because of I'm, I'm dismissing you know their organization um in the last couple of years. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, it's also they have a lot more time to be able to build a proper roster. True. I mean, true. LGE is the uh, organization that was running the roster for the Valiant, um, and they had no time to be able to do anything last year because uh, the, the horrific business decisions being made by the company that gave them that power to do so. So uh, they this year, they, had, they actually have some time to be able to work with, and they also seem like they've got a almost relatively uncontested selection over Chinese talent. It's not completely uncontested, but a lot of the organizations based in North America don't really seem to be paying attention to Chinese talent. You were saying, Albert, that you did trial, or at least you said you were interested in some Chinese talent as well. But just generally, there seems to be this hands-off approach to otherwise very good players that come out of Chinese contenders. Yeah, I think for the U.S. <laughs> part, it just the infrastructure is a little different. I think in the U.S., you, you kind of, okay, let's we have a Korean translator. If you have a Korean players, generally speaking, but then it's like, what happens when you have Koreans, Americans, and a Chinese player? It's like, then do you need addition? You know, right? Like, do you need to get an additional Chinese translator, Chinese staff, just for one player, right, or two players? Um, it's just like an additional. There's like other costs besides just the player, yeah. right? Unless they're fully bilingual and fully fluent, um, which, as far as I know, is pretty rare. I don't know of any Chinese. I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't know if you need top tier Chinese players that are just fluent in English. Um, so I think that's kind of probably why you don't see as many in the u.s um or at least from from na orgs but we were interested like i actually talked to no hill a bunch kind of this off season um like kind of picking his brain about like chinese talent um and we were gonna we were gonna trial him for assistant coach actually and then he got the offer for you know to head coach valiant and so obviously he took the head coaching spot i mean who wouldn't sure. um and it seems like he's kind of building you know all the team cc pieces that haven't been picked up already he's kind of He's kind of picking them up, and uh, yeah, I, I think they hit a good timing window for them. Uh, it's kind of at the tail end, so relatively uncontested. Like, if there's players that haven't been sold yet or something, like they have, they're probably one of the only teams interested, um, and so they have kind of have more leverage and kind of can get more bang for their buck in terms of um, what they have now. So I think, right, right. yeah, so I, I think it's good timing. Um, I think they're doing a better job this year building a roster than they did last year for sure. Um, it would be not... hard to do a worse <laughs> job. Yeah. And, and No Hill has, like, I, I think the question for me is, like, will No Hill live up to his, like, contender's resume? Because I think his contender's resume is, like, legitimately crazy. Like, yeah, on yeah. paper, is you know, it's it's going to be hard to live up to, like, kind of those expectations of, of what he was able to do with his contender's rosters. Um, so we'll see how how he does in, in Overwatch 2. Um, we actually scrimmed them a bit, a fair bit, though. You know, while they're doing their trials, and we were trialing, we kind of, kind of scrimmed on the Overwatch Two workshop. So, we've uh, we, we've seen their we've seen their roster, or at least you know most of their roster. 
yeah. you want to tell me about that later after the show I'm yeah <laughs> I'm, I I really was um, disappointed that some of the Chinese, especially Chinese flex support talent, although actually main support as well, didn't really get showcased too much over the years in the Overwatch League, especially the, uh, I'm thinking about Spark and Shanghai Dragons particularly, yeah. but I'm sure there might have been other teams involved as well. But people like uh, Molly and Coldest and uh, Mika and... God, there must be other people as well that I'm forgetting here too. Super but, Rich didn't get signed for a long time. Who, sorry? Super, super Rich. Yes, just got I mean, Super Rich never even got signed though, right? Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. So, he just got yeah. signed to the Spark now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But, the, but what I mean more so is like, these players were on rosters, but often just kind of played second fiddle and barely got playtime. Like some of them yeah. did get a decent amount of playtime. Like Molly started getting played quite a bit more. But generally speaking, they were kind of second fiddle to Korean backlines. And... When I was watching them, like doing research on them, watching the VODs of their contenders' performances, these players are genuinely cracked and yeah. just didn't get an opportunity in like a full Chinese Overwatch team or at least enough infrastructure uh, o Overwatch League team to be able to showcase it. So I'm, I'm hyped for any kind of Valiant project that has good talent involved that they're going to support effectively. I guess, I guess this is why I'm so hyped uh, about no hill signing to the Valiant here and like seeing some of the players rumored here like picking up Huyal as a coach is like pretty interesting because he played this past year and now he's a coach for the team um wait who was this player I um didn't I read recently that a player would, would also act as a coach who was I think that? that was I think that rumor was about Huyal I think was it I think so okay. wait who is going to be playing I as well I, I don't know about the player coach somewhere I don't know if this is the Jake situation I actually have no idea but yeah I I think that rumor was about we all playing as well, but I don't know. I don't actually know because it okay. the announcement said he was a coach. It doesn't say player oh, yeah. coach. Yeah, uh, there was there was a Halo tweet lost in the mix as well. Um, Halo I mean, that would Uyo be as a player coach. Meaning that Kalios would be bizarre Valiant. because you've got so much on your plate already. Learning the brand new tank role, I feel, especially for a player that wasn't. I don't know. Uh, that's a that is really weird if that's the case, but. <laughs> That's certainly an interesting storyline to follow. Yeah, the who y'all player coach story. I, why wouldn't you announce him as a player coach if he was a player? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's the only know. reason why I'm like, is he a player coach? Because like he wasn't announced as one. Whereas like Jake yeah. was like, you know, he he was it was announced that he was going to be a player coach. Yeah. 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 yeah we'll see. But um. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we'll see how No Hill does in the Overwatch League. Like com coming into the Overwatch League and building a team in the Overwatch League and being successful is uh, a little bit different. Um, not trying to, you know, disrespect his great achievements in the contenders. Um, it is a bit different, but I really do feel like there is the opportunity to just come into the Overwatch League, and if you have a genuinely great understanding of Chinese and Korean uh, contenders, being able to um, pick up the players that you that you uh, have an eye for like i i really do think that they could build something special here going into next season so i'm not going to um dismiss the valiant if they secure some of these great pickups from the scene what is the best that we what is the best performance we've seen from a mixed korean chinese roster it's got to be like the sparks fourth place finish or something right it's not season one shanghai i'll tell you that that's not it <laughs> But uh, but they they have historically struggled a little. Although when I'm saying historically, there's basically only one team that's really, oh, well. I guess Shanghai have also tried to some degree. Although most of the time their full roster is just Korean players. So I feel like when uh, Shanghai's tried, it's been in like matches that they know they're gonna win, and they're just kind of like, okay, like let's let's empty out the bench and get them some reps. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess it's perhaps unfair to extrapolate just from the Hangzhou Spark, but the Spark has really struggled with getting effective coaching and uh, systems in place to be able to overcome that challenge of blending the... Honestly, I think it's just the communication. I'm not really sure how much it's like, you know, the, the culture of the team and the camaraderie and whatever. Yeah. It just the communication barrier seems to be um, relatively large there. Uh, I'm interested to see what the Valiant do because it seems like it, it. from what they did last year, I imagine they're operating on a bit more of a shoestring kind of level, which doesn't lean towards excellent support for like 
translators and ensuring that the coaching staff can co communicate effectively between everybody. Uh, but it would be very interesting if the Valiant managed to pull it off where the spark has failed for many years. Well, I think the difference here is Valiant's going to be signing Chinese players with an intent to start them, whereas I don't know what Spark was doing. Like, it seemed like the Chinese players were always, like, in afterthought. It was like, oh, we have, like... They couldn't... It basically seemed like they couldn't figure out a way to integrate any Chinese players except for Gushra, right? Like, it yes, just, it did. Gushra's our starting like main tank, and then they added a bunch of Chinese players, and they're like, okay, well, actually, maybe they just, you know, weren't as good as their Korean counterparts and, like, Gushra, and then just never worked out. But it seems I mean, like here in Valiant, yeah. it's like... They don't have a 12-man roster, right? Like, it's just... This is the roster they have. Like they're gonna, they're gonna end up starting like a, a, a decent number of Chinese players. Yeah, yeah. I mean, shy as well, right? They have like. Uh... Oh, that's true. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I, I I understand your point. They definitely did feel like an afterthought, whereas the Valiant will have to make this work. Um, okay. Well, I've very much enjoyed our our discussion today, Albert. Uh, but there's a very important segment that we must end things on, and mm. uh, it's Bren's Player of the Week. And I, I haven't spoken to Bren. I'm not going to lie to you all. I'm not going to lie to you all and tell you that I have. And so I'm going to pick an outrageous one, actually. I'm going to pick... Oh. I'm going to pick a player because, I mean, like you said, the competitive Overwatch subreddit, it's it's currently in a comatose state, like a bear hibernating for the winter. <laughs> but I did see a tweet yesterday that made me just cackle while I was out having dinner. So Jonathan's got his, got his thinking face on. Can you... Have you pieced it together? Do you know what that no. one is? I have nope. no idea. <laughs> I'm going to give Bren's Player of the Week to Super for an incredible oh marketing God. effort. Oh unbelievable no. marketing it's... effort for, oh. for, for, <laughs> for getting mommymilkers.net <laughs> to redirect oh to his God. Twitch page. I think this is very fucking good. I think this is elite level marketing. This is why he gets paid the big what? bucks. That's that's the that's the reason that people want him on their Overwatch League team, what man. That's so fucking funny. <laughs> I didn't press the link. I'm gonna be honest. Wait, I he deleted. Like, oh. Wait, he deleted it, right? I mean, no, it's still. I mean, Kurt's it's pulled clear. it up right now. It says, yeah, "Hey, I'm right. alive. Check oh, out." Never mind. It's right there. Okay. Mommymilkers.net, and it just redirects to Twitch.tv/slash/SuperTF. <laughs> oh. I sat on the couch next to my uh, girlfriend, and I was like, "I don't need this in my life." Like, I don't need to press this link. There's no need. <laughs> what uh, What without. were you scared of? You were scared of the mommy milkers, obviously. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Jonathan has no answer. He doesn't know what exactly he can get away with saying. <laughs> it's just silence. No, I mean, I like this. So he wins Bren's Player of the Week. The, the bar gets lowered a lot in the offseason. If you're okay. a player... You can do you can do just about anything, and you'll win Brent's Player of the Week next week. At least so. you picked an Overwatch League player. Yeah, exactly. Milkers.net, like that's the Player of the Week. Well, no, well, yeah, the URL isn't quite Perfect. the Player of the Week. Oh, Super's the Player of the Week for <laughs> getting the URL. Yeah. 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 All right, well, that does it for episode 116. I hope you uh, enjoyed this episode. It was certainly more insightful because it's somebody who knows more about what's going on this offseason than we do usually when we've got ourselves rabbiting on about things. Um, I'm going to be traveling next week, so I don't know whether I'll be around, but we'll have uh, Connor and Matt and Jonathan and Kurt. some well, other Kurt people, Kurt. I'm absolutely sure. Uh, subscribe to our back. YouTube channel. We've got more ideas for the offseason. What's up? Can I get Connor back or what? Are you guys done with him in Texas or? Oh, yeah. We actually sent him back. If he hasn't arrived yet, you should start looking for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've we whisked away one of your employees on a uh, all expense paid holiday for 12 days. <laughs> and when I say all expenses paid, he slept on my floors. <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there weren't that many expenses. <laughs> but we'll see you for episode 117. Goodbye. Woo!